Are you looking to build a budget gaming PC, but not quite sure which GPU to pick? It's a question that a lot of people are asking right now. And with more options than ever, and more controversy than ever in the GPU market, it can be really tricky to tell apart the good GPUs from the bad, and know what to look for when buying a card for your next gaming PC. Well, in today's video, I've gathered up all of the budget GPUs currently offered by AMD, Nvidia, and Intel, tested them in the most popular titles, and I'll be giving you a definitive answer as to the best cards to buy for every price point. So without any further ado, let's dive into it. The Deepcool LQ360 is here with a segmented LCD display to tastefully show key system metrics such as CPU temp, CPU load and power consumption. What's more, you get full RGB on the pump head and included fans and the choice of a white or black cooler design to choose from. Deepcool's 5 Pro generation pump keep temperatures low while a rotatable pump cap keeps the orient option open. Learn more about the Deepcool LQ360 and pick one up for yourself at the first link in the description below. I want to start off by addressing a few really important points. The first is whether you should go AMD, Intel or Nvidia. The second is how much you should spend for a GPU in a budget build. And third and finally, I want to talk about VRAM or video memory. I want to start by talking about the three brands you can choose from when buying a GPU. Presently in the budget end of the market, you've got AMD, Nvidia or Intel. Now Intel are a more recent addition and join a sector that's been dominated by AMD and Nvidia for the longest time. Now, Nvidia have typically always had the largest market share and remain the most popular option for gamers across all price points. Nvidia tend to give you the most well-rounded and most advanced features. Their ray tracing, DLSS and frame generation are still better than their competitors' alternative options, but they will charge you a little more money for the pleasure and they tend to be more stingy with things like video memory, but more on that later. AMD have typically been a great option in the budget space for those that want to save a bit of cash. Historically, AMD GPUs were a lot cheaper cheaper than their NVIDIA counterparts. And that was to offset things like the fact the drivers weren't that great, the game optimizations were often kind of substandard, but that's not the case anymore. AMD is pretty much on par with NVIDIA in that regard nowadays, which is great, but it has pushed the price of their cards up. Intel are the most recent addition to this space. Now they launched their first generation art cards to excitement, but in the end widespread disappointment. But their second gen art cards we've got here, the B580 and B570, have both proved to be much better options and may provide a challenge to the existing market players. Now don't confuse GPU brands like AMD and Nvidia and Intel with their board partners. This is where it gets complicated. So AMD, Nvidia and Intel design the GPUs. They don't actually make them, that's down to TSMC and Samsung who are the fabs, but they do design the cards. They then license these cards to board partners or sell their board partners the chips and the memory modules that they need. Board partners are people like Gigabyte, PowerColor, Sapphire and Azrock, who work with the respective GPU manufacturers to design their own card variants. Now, in recent years, we've seen more first party designs. Intel, for example, sell their own limited edition design of their Arc GPUs. Nvidia do the same with their RTX Founders Edition cards, while AMD tend to be more board partner exclusive, especially in the current generation. Now, not all board partners make cards for all manufacturers. MSI, for example, is pretty much only Nvidia. Asus, for example, will do Nvidia and AMD. AMD, but you won't necessarily be able to pick from all the different board partners for all the different brands of GPUs. It's also worth briefly explaining how the naming schemes work. Intel's really simple. You've got B570 and then B580. The bigger the number, the higher end the card. Nvidia have their RTX 5000 series. And again, the higher the two digit number at the end, the higher end the card. TI just means it's a more powerful version of a non-TI derivative. While on AMD, again, the higher the number, the better the GPU. And if it has XT, that's again similar to TI. It just represents a more powerful GPU version of the non-XT version should that particular card exist. So we've covered off GPU brands, board partners and naming schemes, but what about spending? How much should you actually spend on a GPU in a budget gaming PC build? As a general rule of thumb, I like to recommend that you spend between 40 and 60% of your build budget on the graphics card, but this percentage is going to vary widely depending on how much you're spending on your system on the whole. On the higher end, it's easier to spend a larger portion of your build budget on the GPU as things like cases, coolers and power supply 
supplies don't tend to scale in how expensive they are proportional to a GPU. On the budget end of the spectrum, you may be forced to spend less on the GPU as you still need to pick up a CPU, cooler, case and power supply. They're parts you can't forgo in your build. Just remember at all times that the GPU is the most important component when it comes to gaming performance, so that's why you'll want to allocate as much money here as possible while minimizing bottlenecks elsewhere. The final bit of important context to talk about is video memory, and this is really important, especially right now. Now, video memory is the amount of memory that's built into the card for storing things like all your texture and pixel information. Now, historically, this is also referred to as a frame buffer, and like with most things in life, the bigger the better. It is a little more nuanced and more complicated than that. We have things called memory bandwidth, which dictates how much bandwidth there is to the memory, and different generations of memory have different memory speeds as well. The important point to focus on is how much VRAM a card has. Now for 1080p gaming, you're going to want a minimum of eight gigabytes. But as games get bigger and more intensive and the textures within those games get more and more demanding and more impressive to look at, that eight gigabyte VRAM buffer is going to become, relatively speaking, less and less. Now for 1440p, you absolutely need more than eight gigs. You want to be in the 12 gigabyte region, but there's certainly an advantage even at 1080p to looking at cards with higher VRAM amounts. I mean, check out Indiana Jones and the Great Circle on the 9060 XT, and you can see here that it's gonna swallow up way more than that eight gig amount of VRAM that you're going to see on some of the cheaper cards. If you're only playing Apex Legends, Fortnite, and Valorant, VRAM is much less likely to be a problem. But if you've got your eyes on AAA titles and you've got your eye on a little bit of 1440p gaming down the line, you absolutely should avoid eight gigabyte cards unless you're aware of some of the implications that VRAM amount might have. So with that then, let's talk about the best options. And let's start first of all with the sub $250 price point. Now for sub $250, you've got two choices, the Intel Arc B570 or the RTX 5050. Now the RTX 5050 comes in for 249 USD, while the B570 comes in for 219. Now in actuality, real world pricing, according to Newegg at the time of filming, does put the 5050 at its MSRP and the B570 just over. Yeah. So that's something to consider. Comparing the specs of the card, the RTX 5050 has just eight gigabytes of GDDR6 video memory, while the Intel Arc B570 pushes this up to 10 gigabytes of GDDR6. Starting off with Apex Legends at 1080p high, and bearing in mind that the frame rate here is capped at a maximum of 300, the Intel Arc B570 pulls in an average of 237.4 frames per second, which is only very marginally lower than the 238.5 FPS you'll find on the 5050. Safe to say in this title, the two cards are pretty even Stevens. In Call of Duty's Black Ops 6 at 1080p high rasterization, the Intel Arc B570 pulls in just 75.7 FPS, which is a lot lower than the RTX 5050's 92.9. In Hogwarts Legacy, we see a similarly pronounced difference between these GPUs, the B570 pulling in 76 FPS, and the RTX 5050 actually pulling in 91 frames per second on average, while in Indiana Jones and the Great Circle at 1080p were actually restricted to medium settings. That's right, the eight gigs of VRAM on the 5050 means we can't test at high. Looking at the results, the B570 does still fall short to the RTX 5050 with 80 FPS versus the 5050's 90.6. And you can see here that across the board, the RTX 5050 is delivering the stronger results. Now, in many ways, these results leave me a bit conflicted because a lot of reviews on the internet would suggest the RTX 5050 is the worst product ever. Now, to be clear, I think if you're willing to spend an extra $50, which is our next price bracket, the RTX 5050 just doesn't make sense. If you've got the extra cash, you can get a lot more for your money. But it does beat out the B570 pretty much across the board. And even at 1440p, the VRAM isn't enough to save the slower rasterization performance offered by the B570. This is a prime example of where extra VRAM can be great, but only if the card's fast enough to actually use it. So then, what more do you get if you spend an extra $50. Well, really, there are three cards actually to talk about. The RX 9060 XT, the Intel Arc B580, and the RTX 5060. Now, specifically here, I'm talking about the eight gigabyte RX 9060 XT, as the 16 gig model, which I'll be looking at in a moment, comes in over budget for this price point. In Marvel's Rivals at 1080p high, the RTX 5060 actually tops the charts with a frame rate of 115.3 FPS on average. Now, this is sizably 
faster than the B580 and RX 9060 XT 8 gig. The 8 gig 9060 XT pulls in just 90 FPS, while the B580 actually lags behind the 5050 with just 86.6. Indiana Jones and the Great Circle at 1080p high settings sees the Arc B580 pull in 84 FPS, with the 9060 XT pulling in 88. You'll notice that the 5060 is missing, you just can't benchmark this on an NVIDIA GPU at high settings with 8 gigabytes of VRAM, so dropping down to medium to understand its relative performance position, and the RTX 5060 actually outperforms the B580, but falls short by around 11 FPS to the 8 gig 9060 XT, so a pretty big difference in Indiana Jones. Hogwarts Legacy at 1080p high rasterization puts the RTX 5060 at 126 frames per second. This is actually marginally lower than the 133 FPS from the 8 gig 9060 XT, and quite a lot faster than the 101.9 frames per second from the B580. Finally, for this price point in Cyberpunk at 1080p high, the RX 9060 XT 8 gig delivers an incredibly strong 125 FPS, faster than the 5060's 121, and a lot faster than the B580's 105.2. Now, again, looking at the results here, and the B580 is a card that's had an amazing reception from Intel, but the reality of the situation is that it just hasn't kept up with the newer 9050 series releases from AMD and Nvidia, respectively. And as such, it's 12 gigabyte video memory buffer might be beneficial to some, but it just doesn't make that much sense. Now, let's give it the benefit of the doubt and have a quick look at some 1440p numbers too. Based on a lot of the rhetoric online, you'd think 1440p would save it. Now in Cyberpunk at 1440p high, the Intel Arc B580 pulls in just 74 FPS. That's five frames per second less than the eight gigabyte 5060, and even less than the 84 FPS seen from the eight gig 9060 XT. Okay, that's just one title. What about Hogwarts Legacy? Well, at 1440p high rasterization, the Intel Arc B580 pulls in a frankly paltry 68 frames per second, much less than the 85 and 93 FPS seen from the NVIDIA RTX 5060 and AMD RX 9060 8 gig respectively. Indiana Jones and the Great Circle at 1440p high will surely save the Intel card given its huge reliance on VRAM, but unfortunately not. The B580 again falls short, to the RX 9060 XT 8 gigabyte, this time by over 10%. Again, that makes choosing a card at this price point kind of difficult. I just can't recommend the B580 given how the competition beats it out at pretty much every turn. The best card really based on our data for strictly under $300 would be the 9060 XT 8 gigabyte. But again, without wanting to drive your budget up in what is a budget GPU buyer's guide, I don't know if this makes a great deal of sense either. And that will become apparent by moving through to my GPU recommendations for under $350. And unfortunately, there's only one. And it's this, the RX 9060 XT. Now for the purposes of the graph, I'll also be pointing out comparative results such as the RTX 5060 Ti, but they don't actually fit in this price point. Now the 16 gig 9060 XT comes in for $349. And for the extra $50, what you'll get in is a 9060 XT with a bit more future proofing. Now to be clear, I really don't like the way AMD have handled these cards. I really think that the eight gig version should have been called the 9060 non-XT and the 16 gig version, the XT derivative. As simply put, the little VRAM sticker in the bottom is just not clear enough for a lot of people who don't know PC building all that well. But what you do get with the 16 gig card is a GPU that punches above its weight for its price point and gives you that little bit of future proofing and peace of mind when it comes to video memory. In the likes of Call of Duty's Black Ops 6 Zombies, the RX 9060 XT frankly wipes the floor with the competition, actually weirdly beating out the RTX 5070. This is a game where AMD do tend to be unusually competitive competitive in terms of performance. While Cyberpunk gives us a slightly more realistic and representative result, the RX 9060 XT 16 gigabyte actually matching the RTX 5060 Ti with 132.2 FPS on average. Move through into Hogwarts Legacy again at that 1080p high settings, and here the 9060 XT 16 gig pulls in 156 FPS, beating out the 7700 XT from last generation, beating out the 8 gigabyte 9060 XT by over 20 frames per second. That that's the power of the 
the extra VRAM, the actual silicon, the die, the chips in these are exactly the same otherwise. And of course, leaving the likes of the RTX 5060, a card that I will remind you costs just $50 less for dust. Now, if I move through to some of the 1440p results, you can see where the 9060 XT 16 gigabyte does start to really hold its own. Trading blows with the RX 7800 XT, 16 gig 4060 Ti from last generation, and slotting in not that far behind the RTX 4070 Super. So all this really comes down to then is a lot of conversation around video memory. And I think that a lot of those conversations right now are necessary and they need to happen. But I do think in some areas they get a little bit blown out of proportion. In many ways, Intel's received a huge amount of positive publicity on their B580, which to be clear, when compared to the last gen 4060 and 7600 on release, provided favorable performance. But based on the fact it's got 12 gigs of VRAM, despite really, in my opinion, the card not having quite the power it needs to really leverage that VRAM amount. Now, do I think the RTX 5060 would have been a much more capable GPU with 12 gigs of video memory and a slightly wider VRAM bus? Yes. And similarly, there are cards we've not talked about today because they represent poor value for money, like the 5060 Ti, that should never ever be shipping in an eight gigabyte derivative. And frankly, that's a joke. However, if you're looking to game at 1080p and you're not interested in all the latest flashy AAA titles, there are deals to be had on cards like this 8 gig 9060 XT. Here in the UK, they're obviously not selling that well, and that's why the prices have dropped so harshly. If you're an esports gamer and that's all you're looking to do, the 8 gigabyte cards actually represent for you amazing value for money. So what are my recommendations then? Now, if you want to spend less than 250, the data says you should buy this, the 5050. Now, the alternative might be to pick up a used RTX 4060. That's going to give you a bit more firepower still. But to be honest, I don't think the 5050, given the competition right now, is a bad option. Of course, AMD might bring out a 9060 non-XT or 9050 XT, and that might change things. But as we stand and on the day of filming this video, that's not the case. If you want to spend $300, you're probably going to get this, the 9060 XT 8 gig. I would just strongly encourage you to keep your eyes peeled for deals on the 16 gig card. And if you can stretch your budget that far, definitely make sure you compare the two and check on a game by game basis how that VRAM difference is going to affect your PC build. What do you guys think of my GPU recommendations? Did I explain the state of the GPU market? Buying a budget GPU is just really complicated right now. And all we really need is like a, I don't know, 50, 55 with 10 or 12 gigs of VRAM for $270. That would be good, wouldn't it? But it doesn't exist. So yeah, until that point, 9060 XT 8 gig if you absolutely have to, the 16 gig if you can afford to buy it, and probably the 5050 if you want to spend as little as possible, but still buy a new GPU. If you enjoyed today's video, make sure to get subscribed. Thanks for watching. And as always, we'll see you in the next one.